As you all know, I work with the uh, UCLA Anderson Forecast. We're a research organization based out of the Anderson School at UCLA. Uh, in fact, we'll be coming down here in a couple months to do our first sort of region. We've, we've started a series of regional conferences, and we're very excited. We're going to be partnering with the uh, new business school, the Rady School here, along with Western Financial Bank. And we're coming down here in a couple months to do our first regional conference, and uh, we're real excited to be here. Uh, today, of course, I got about 30 minutes to tell you about the economy. And more importantly, talk to you a little bit about uh, real estate. As you know, San Diego and the rest of California is in the midst of an amazing run-up in real estate, both in terms of prices as well as in terms of building. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that quite a bit today. But before I go there, let's get right into it and let's talk a little bit about the overall economy. Uh, again, I can't emphasize enough over the last couple of years how good the economy has been in many, many ways. We had 10 straight quarters of above average growth, a run that was not even uh, seen in the late 90s during that massive internet boom. Uh, and in the midst of all that wonderful economic expansion, of course, we had very little signs of any kind of inflation. Now, we did have that run up in energy prices, but that did not translate through to the core rate. The core rate stayed about 2%. And of course, if you believe anybody, you got to believe the bond markets, and they're certainly not afraid of overall inflation, uh, given that those bond rates remained at a very stable level, somewhere between 4 and 5%. So really, the economy has been doing, doing very, very well. Of course, the fourth quarter, we had a 1.1% growth. And a lot of people might be questioning, well, is this the beginning of the end? Is this some sort of slowdown? The answer is, is most definitely not. While that 1.1% was certainly not up to snuff for the 10 preceding quarters, you got to keep in mind two things. First of all, there are no indications that we are moving into a recessionary economy. And we know that for two reasons. One, of course, is that productivity growth still remains very, very strong. And the second reason is the characteristics of growth in that fourth quarter are not the kind of characteristics of growth that we see in an economy slipping into a downturn. Primarily, if you look at overall gross private investment, uh, the STREC is a standard recession, and you can see that a slowdown in business spending is a prime component of a move into a recessionary economy. And of course, business spending was very, very strong. You also usually see a slowdown in spending on non-durable goods, and spending on non-durable goods remain very, very strong. What did you see in the fourth quarter? What you saw was a return to earth of the automobile sector. You had a big pullback in consumer spending, primarily on automobiles. My guess is we finally ran out of space in our driveways, and there's just no more room to put any more cars, and that's what you saw. So don't worry about that fourth quarter. First quarter is going to be coming right back soon. Uh, other indicators are very decent. Uh, we've seen decent growth in payroll. That unemployment rate has fallen below 5%. Manufacturing output is on its way up. Lots of good signs inside the economy. And of course, despite all that Fed tightening, you've had a circumstance in which those bond markets have kept that rate, like I said, between 4 and 5%. So that Fed, rent, Fed funds rate has been coming up, but the bond rate, Nice and stable, lots of, uh, lots of stimulus, lots of cheap capital out there. That's also helping keeping the U.S. economy moving forward. Of course, if you look at that very closely, the convergence of the three-year and the 10-year rate, this is what economists like to refer to as a flattening yield curve. And I do want to show you the history of this going back to the mid-'80s, because you know this has been two periods of time in which the yield curve has dropped this precipitously close to zero. And those two times are back in 1990 and, of course, in 2000. Uh, now, Ross could probably tell you a little bit more about this than I can about the specifics. It's a little bit arcane talking about the relationship between the yield curve and overall economic performance. What I do know, though, is we haven't quite hit zero. Uh, so this is not necessarily, again, the beginning of the end. But this is a big worry because a flat yield curve like this is a very strong predictor of economic problems in the future. So keep an eye on this over the next few months. We'll see if that bounces back a little bit or if that continues into the zero zone. It may be indications of what, uh, of what real estate might be starting to do to the U.S. economy. Of course, a little closer to home, a very similar story. Um, you have a circumstance in which uh, in 2005, employment in the state finally got above that peak we had hit in 2001. 
Uh, overall growth in the state was really positive everywhere. Again, you got to remember there was three kinds of economies in California, and all three had different trajectories through the 2001 downturn. The Central Valley, a center of basically home building, continued to boom along very well. The Bay Area, center of the tech boom, got crushed, center of the tech bust. Importantly, the Bay Area really got back on a growth track in 2005. San Jose in particular finally bottomed out and started to see a little upward movement. So overall, the state is doing fairly well. Uh, Non-residential construction in the state, of course, remains weak for two reasons. One, we still have a tremendous excess supply, particularly up in the Bay Area, of commercial, uh, commercial space. Uh, a lot of that, of course, is diminishing demand for a lot of new construction. On top of that, of course, you have to add in the fact that we've seen a massive run-up in real estate prices, uh, excuse me, in, in real estate construction costs uh, in California and the rest of the United States over the last few years because of steel, because of concrete, and of course here in California because of land costs. You add those two things up, lots of excess capacity, rising costs, and you're not seeing a lot, any kind of new substantial increase in non-residential uh, demand, at least on the basis of these uh, construction permits that we collect on a regular basis. Uh, office absorption and warehouse absorption, on the other hand, are positive. Again, more signs that the underlying California economy has been moving along. And of course, as we certainly know, uh, the, 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 one of the biggest stories remains real estate. This is the medium price of a house in California, and your eyes don't deceive you. Back in 19, excuse me, in 2000, the median price of a house in California was $200,000. Today, it's over $450,000. A spectacular, spectacular run-up in prices like we've never seen before. And at the same time, we're in the midst of a building boom. For the last two years, California has built something over 200,000 units of new residential space. Really quite incredible. So looking ahead, you start thinking about the economy. I always look for app metaphors. Uh, my metaphor right now is what I call the, uh, the good, the not so bad, and the ugly economy, because that's what we have. Um, the good, of course, Growth, again, remains strong. Don't worry about that fourth quarter number. Productivity is good. Interest rates are good. Unemployment's good. The not so bad. Uh, worker income is not going up very much. It's being pushed down by the rising cost of benefits. Manufacturing jobs, which have been such an important long-run driver for the health of the California economy, they never bounce back after 2001. And my guess is they're not going to be bouncing back any time in the near future. Uh, the U.S. is producing more manufactured goods than ever before, but we're doing it with fewer and fewer workers because of productivity growth, because of information technology. Uh, on the other hand, we can overcome that because, again, there's enough job growth in the service sector to absorb a lot of those workers, as indicated by that low unemployment rate. But the ugly parts of the economy, the parts of the economy that we're very, very worried about, and that's the current account deficit, that private savings rate, and, of course, the real estate bubble, and, yes, I did use the B word. Now, to understand how we got here, you've got to go back in time a little bit and understand something about the 2001 downturn. Now, what is a recession? Right off the bat, understand that a recession is not a normal state of the economy, it's an anomaly. It's, it's an unusual state. The normal state of, of, an econo of an economy is growth, not, uh, not, you know, unlike most politicians who want to convince you that they're the sole reason for an economy expanding. In fact, that's not the case. Growth is a normal state for an economy, but every once in a while, we stop growing and the economy actually starts to shrink. We call that anomaly or recession, and that's characterized by workers who want to find jobs but can't find jobs. We call that high unemployment, and companies that want to find buyers for their goods but can't find buyers. As a result, they don't produce much in the way of output. We call that low capacity utilization. Those are the characteristics of a recession. Now, what causes a recession, recession is typically some sort of shock that hits the economy. It kind of works this way. A shock hits the economy. That shock causes aggregate demand to come down, causing people to lose income, lose their jobs, causing aggregate demand to go down more, and so on and so forth in this kind of vicious cycle. That's what we call a uh, recession. Now, where do these shocks come from? They can come from lots of different places. In 2001, the shock came from the business sector. That is to say, there was a massive run-up in investment in the late 90s period. That's that black line. The blue line represents corporate profits in the U.S. economy. Now, notice about 1997, something happened. Usually, investment should beget profit. That's sort of the way the business community works. 
But in 1997, despite record increases in business spending, primarily on infrastructure, but also in the infrastructure around information technology, all those, pro those promised profits, all those productivity gains, and all the wonders of the information age never emerged. And profits were basically flat right through 2000. In the middle of 2000, businesses said enough is enough. They pull back radically on spending, or not radically, but dramatically on spending. And of course, as a result of that pullback in business spending, that caused the economy to slow down in the 2001 recession. What got the economy moving again? Well, no, not again, no big surprise. Profits returned, and with profits came business spending, and with business spending, the economy got moving again. Now, overall, it was a very mild downturn. And the reason it was a mild downturn is because we only had a downturn in one part of the economy. Now, what I have here is three graphics rep poorly representing uh, th three most important cyclical components of the economy, and that is residential investment, spending on consumer durables, and business investment. Why are these cyclical? Well, cars, houses, and machines have something in common, and that is to say that a business or a consumer can say, look, you know, I got to feed the kids, I got to buy them clothes, I got to have gas in my car. On the other hand, I can make my car last another year, I can make my house last another year, I can make that machine last another year. So when times ahead look like they're going to be rough, when there's some pulling back in aggregate demand, these are the things that companies and people don't buy, hence they get the big cycles. Through the business, through the through a recession. Now, if you look, here's a picture of percent of GDP made up of spending on houses, consumer durables, and, and business spending. And if you look care carefully, those gray bars, up and down bars, represent past recessions inside the United States. Now, look, before the gray bars, you could see a pullback in spending on houses and cars and furniture. We don't have business cycles, we have consumer cycles because the shocks to the U.S. economy typically start in the consumer sector and in the midst of the recession, that's when businesses pull back on spending. Remember what I said about that fourth quarter, why I wasn't worried about it? Because we didn't see a pullback on business spending. Again, that's very indicative of moving into a recessionary period. Now, the one exception to this rule that recessions start with the consumer is, in fact, 2001. It was an incredibly unusual, in fact, unique recession since World War II because it was the first recession that was started not by consumers but by businesses. A big pullback in business spending and that pushed the U.S. economy down. But here's the interesting thing. Consumers never followed. Where businesses tend to follow consumers, in this case, consumers did not follow the businesses. What we had was a recession almost completely on the business spending side of the economy and spending on new homes and cars and furniture continued along as if nothing was wrong with the economy. And that binge continues. In fact, I don't know if you noticed, but in 2005, for the first time, the private savings rate in the U.S. had gone negative. Now, I got to understand, I got to explain what the savings rate is because a lot of people think of savings as a stock. That is, say, how much I have saved, how much is in my 401k. When we talk about the savings rate, that's a flow measure. What it is, is we say, okay, what's the disposable income of the workforce and how much do they spend? We take, take the disposable income minus spending, put it over disposable income, and that's the savings rate. It's what percent of your current income you're rolling into your savings. And that was negative. That is to say that, that American consumers spent more than they were earning after taxes in 2005. Really quite spectacular. Now, to some extent, the savings rate's been falling for a while and for very legitimate reasons. As our population becomes older, as we have more people on the, on the shall we say, the right-hand side of 65 as opposed to the left-hand side of 65, so overall savings rate in the U.S. economy is going to go down. But that certainly can't explain it dipping into the negative territories. What can explain it? Well, of course, in the midst of that internet rush, consumers bought into the new economy just as much as businesses did, and they said, wow, unlimited future. Uh, the world's going to be wonderful. No more business cycles. 5% growth. What the hell? I'll buy a BMW now. And they did. And then the recession hit, and all those things came true, but they kept their BMW. They didn't bother to get rid of it. And then, of course, when the economy got moving again, they went out and they bought another BMW. And that's where we are right now. We're in the midst of really a, a, a consumer binge across the nation. And it's not just a binge on the basis of private consumers, we're also on a spending binge on the part of the federal government, as we all know. Now, I keep hearing how we've had tax cuts in the United States, folks. We have not had tax cuts in the United States. A tax cut is when you cut taxes and cut spending. 
When you cut taxes and increase spending, that's called a tax deferral, all right? Not a tax, <laughs> not a tax cut, okay? And we've had massive tax deferrals in the U.S. economy. Be that as it may, of course, uh, as you can see, we dipped into the negative territory in 2005. At the same time, the debt servicing level, which, which is a percent of people's income that they're spending on servicing current debt, uh, this also includes such things as rent to try to balance off renters versus people who are paying mortgages. Um, but that was at an all-time high at the beginning of the recession. It came down a little bit, but again, it spiked up towards an all-time high. Really quite disturbing signs. If you want to know how out of whack the U.S. economy is, you need to look no further than the U.S. trade deficit, 5.5% of GDP. We've never seen anything like this before. A lot of people are trying to point at China and saying, gee, it's China's fault because they're keeping their exchange rate too low. Well, look, the exchange rate, the, 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 excuse me, the, the current account deficit is not a big mystery here. It's simply, I learned this back in my first year of economics, the trade deficit is the difference between what a nation produces and what it consumes. Right now, we are consuming 5.5% more than we're producing. Just that simple, because we're on this spending binge. Uh, pointing at the Chinese and saying, gee, it's your fault because you're keeping the exchange rate too low. The metaphor, that they, how I like to compare this, this is like me walking into Walmart and saying, you have to raise your prices because I can't control my spending. <laughs> Doesn't make a lot of sense. Now, admittedly, of course, is the Chinese, if you think about that low yuan, you're talking about a circumstance, of course, in which they are, shall we say, enabling us to be on the spending binge. I wouldn't argue that for a second, just like Walmart enables us to be on a spending binge with its low prices. But to say it's their fault, that's not quite true. So what is driving all this optimism? What is driving this negative rate? Well, there's certainly a number of factors. Like I said, there certainly is a demographic change, but that's kind of a long run issue. Low interest rates, you know, we got used to 20% returns in NASDAQ. What do you mean I'm getting a 0% real return on my, on my treasury bills? You know, not a lot of incentive to save there. That's certainly pushing things down. Um, there is still a sense of optimism. We know that uh, uh, consumer uh, sentiment is, is very high right now. Things seem to be going along. But really what's driving it, my feeling is, what's really driving this, this binge in consumer spending is, of course, housing. Or more specifically, housing wealth. Or even more specifically, new housing wealth. How big a number are we talking about? Well, at the U.S. level, over here on the right-hand side, this is for the United States overall, and this is new housing wealth per worker in real terms, inflation-adjusted terms. And over the last couple years, your average worker in the U.S. has earned about $9,000 on the basis of residential real estate appreciation. That's about a 25% raise. That's a nice chunk and chunk of change. And if you think that's impressive, here in California, last year, your average home, not your average home in La Jolla, not your average home in Laguna Niguel, I'm talking your average home, including Fresno and Barstow and Sacramento, your average home appreciated by $80,000. Every home in California picked up $80,000. Well, on average, every home picked up $80,000. That's a tremendous amount of money, and it makes you feel good. You have an $80,000 check sitting there on your kitchen counter. Is that liable to make you go buy that BMW? Yes. Not a big surprise there. I, you know, I, I have to admit, I've maybe bought a little nicer wine than I'm normally used to, right? We all have. We feel good. So when you think about that, What's really going on in the U.S. economy, of course, is we are borrowing from the Chinese on the basis of how much our house is worth. It might make sense if we're planning on selling our homes to the Chinese at some point in time in the future, but let's not go there quite yet. And if you look around the California economy and say, what is going on here? Well, I'll tell you what's going on. Uh, this is, this, I know there's a lot of numbers here, so let me explain very quickly. Uh, over here on the left column, that's the annual change in jobs in the California economy between January 91 and July 1995. That was our last business cycle. Uh, again, overall U.S. recession combined with a big aerospace collapse here. Very tough times. The state lost, on average, 18,000 jobs between those periods of times. And now I'm comparing that to January 01 to July 05, same period of time in the same portion of the business cycle, we gained about 14,000 jobs. Again. This was a mild cycle relative to what happened in the early 90s. Overall, the difference is about 32,000. Everybody's kind of understand the construct of that. 
Well, I did that same calculation for all the major sectors inside the California economy, and I ranked them top to bottom. So these bottom sectors are those we're not adding this time that we did add last time, and the top is what we are adding this time that we didn't add last time. So what aren't we adding? What's not coming back in the California economy through this business cycle? Well, management of companies, information, administrative and support, uh, non-durable goods, transportation and warehousing, durable goods. If this doesn't look, look, you know, what are these sectors? What are they? Well, these are the sectors that service the external economy. These are the sectors that basically provide us with the terms of trade, of ability to trade with the rest of the world and the rest of the country. These are incredibly important sectors for the long-run health of the California economy. And they're not coming back. There's still a lot of weakness there. Um, there's still, you know, now to some extent, things are getting a little better. There's no doubt about it, particularly through 2005. But overall, we're way behind. So what kind of jobs are we adding? What's been fueling this relatively mild downturn in the California economy? What's been keeping us going? Top three sectors, construction, credit intermediation, and retail trade. In other words, California is all about building new homes, financing the building of new homes, and furnishing our new homes. We're in a home-driven economy top to bottom at this particular point in time. So, very unusual. So let's get on to real estate. Let's talk about real estate. Uh, what I have here, uh, again, this is a long run view. This is year and year change in housing prices, that's that blue line, and year and year change in employment, that's the yellow line. Um, now, as you can see, well, two things you can see here. Right off the bat, despite what the National Association of Realtors is fond of saying, you may see some negative numbers there on housing prices. Of course, the NAR, they say all the time, housing prices in the U.S. have never fallen. Well, that's true if you ignore this little thing called inflation. But most economists, we don't like to ignore that. We think it's something that's a little bit important. Once you take inflation out, sure enough, there's been plenty of periods of time in which the price of a house in the U.S. economy has fallen. When do they tend to fall? They tend to fall in real terms when we're losing jobs. In fact, it's very cyclical. Adding lots of jobs, housing prices going up. Losing lots of jobs, housing prices going down. Except for, of course, 2001. Now, look very carefully there. Again, very unusual. We had a circumstance in which jobs went away and housing prices not only continued to grow, but they accelerated a little bit. And then when those jobs came back, whoo, off the charts. As you can see, we at the U.S. level, we're seeing record rates of real appreciation in housing prices, like we've never seen before, at least as far back as my data goes. Now, maybe if you go back to the 20s or 30s, there may be other periods of time. But as you can see, over the last 30, 40 years, we've never seen anything like this quite spectacular. How big is it? Well, again, in real terms, that 70s bubble, that 70s bubble that gave us my favorite thing in the world, Proposition 13, I'm not going to get into that right now. Uh, but of course, that trial to peak run up in housing prices in real terms, 55%. In the 80s, trial to peak, 45%. Right now in California, 85% in real terms and counting. Big, big numbers. Uh, over here on the right, this is U.S. real housing prices in 2005 terms. And again, you can see that, at least going back to 1975, and if you look at longer history, history basically in today's terms, the average price of a house in the U.S. has been based between 100 and 110,000. Now, admittedly, that's a half a two-car garage here in San Diego. But, you know, again, this is overall U.S. statistics. And that has been a very consistent trend, really, for years. Uh, probably one of the best studies I've seen on this came out of, uh, what's, the, what's the guy's name? The irrational exuberance. Uh, Schiller, thank you. Schiller, of course, did this. He went back like 100 years. And he turns out, by according to his statistics, that the average annual appreciation of a home in the U.S. over the last 100 years or so is basically zero. Zero in real terms, in inflation-adjusted terms. Now, you might say, well, wait a minute. Does that mean the house is the worst investment in the world? Why would anybody buy a house? And you got to keep in mind, you got to, for, to, to, to answer that question, you got to remember that there's two kinds of returns to an asset. One is the appreciation of the actual asset value, and the second part is, of course, the dividend. When we think about assets, we usually think about, say, stocks. And when we think about stocks, we're immediately clouded by the NASDAQ model of the world. This is how the NASDAQ model works. 
You give a couple geeks a million dollars, they go out and make cool toys, they make two million dollars, they take those profits, they roll back into the company to make more toys, to make more money, to make more toys, and the only thing you see as the investor is your stock price going up as this company becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. That's the new model of assets. But the old model of assets is what our grandparents used to invest in, and those are the blue chip stocks. The blue chip stocks, the return was not in the appreciation of the stock price. It was in the fact that they sent your grandparents a dividend on a quarter to quarter basis. That was the return. Well, that's what a home is. It's a blue chip asset. It's an asset where the return is not wrapped up in asset appreciation, but in the dividend. And the dividend, of course, is the rental value. The fact that you get to live in it, that provides a rental value. Even if you own it, you're renting it from yourself. We call that in economics, that lovely term known as opportunity cost. It's a very real thing. In fact, the BEA spends a lot of time and effort calculating the rental value of owned real estate to throw it into the GDP statistics. Um, so, or if you rent it out to somebody else. That's the return on a house. And that's the big question. Now, what is it about homes that have suddenly made them go from that 100 to 110,000 range to 160,000? What makes people think that these assets are now that much more valuable? Not only are we seeing this massive run up in prices, but we're also seeing a massive increase in building. This is real spending per adult on residential real estate in the US. This is building new homes fixing up our existing homes, and importantly, paying our real estate agents to help us do all that. You add that up and you can see that real spending per adult in the U.S. economy has hit an all-time high. We are spending more than ever building new homes and fixing up our existing ones and paying our real estate agents. On the right-hand side here, new units to new households. This is how many new housing units, residential units, are being built in the U.S. economy compared to new families. And no, that's not, that is true what you're seeing there. In 2005, we built 2.6 new residential units for every new household. And that's households including immigrants and everything else. And remember, we're in the midst not of a population explosion, but in a population growth slowdown. So this is incredibly unusual and really completely out of whack considering where future population growth trends have the U.S. economy moving in the next 20 years. Really quite astonishing. Now, of course, Next thing you're going to hear is, well, that may be true in the rest of the U.S. Maybe they're building lots of homes in Florida, but that's not true here in California because we have a massive housing shortage. Okay, we do have a housing shortage in part because of the fact that we have not been built as fast as our uh, workforce base really since 1980. That yellow line is new houses for new workers at compared, uh, California compared to the U.S. Two things to notice that, yes, we have been behind. But over the last five years, we've caught up. We're building homes relative to our work for growth in our workforce at the same base as the U.S. But before you say, okay, well, we're way behind and we have a massive housing shortage, I want to point something out. We do have a massive housing shortage in the California economy, but that housing shortage is in low rent apartments for low income workers, primarily from Latin America. We have a bad housing shortage on the low end of the scale. Do I have any developers in the room? I'm just curious. No builders? One or two. You can raise your hands without being ashamed. Don't worry about it. <laughs> no one? Uh, <laughs> of course, they'll tell you firsthand, why aren't we building those? It doesn't pencil out in California. When you get through the seven years of fighting with the zoning board to try to put high density, uh, high density housing in, along with, of course, all the fixed costs of the land and the materials, and of course, on top of everything else, all those, all those rules and regulations and insurance things you have to get over, it doesn't make any sense to build these kind of units. We're not building them now. We didn't build them 10 years ago, and frankly, we're not gonna be building them 10 years from now without some sort of substantial reform in this system that dictates what kind of things we can build. So yes, we have a housing shortage, but that housing shortage has nothing to do with what's going on in the California economy right now. Right now, we are building plenty of million dollar homes and plenty of million dollar condos. That's not the issue here. And if you don't believe me, let me show you some numbers here. This is what I call crowded housing problems in California on the basis of how many units have more than one person per room living in them. In Orange County and Los Angeles, about 20% of rented units have more than one person per room. That means your standard two-bedroom apartment has five or more people living in it. 
That's one out of five apartments in Orange County and Los Angeles. We're San Diego. Now, you guys aren't so bad. You're only at 12% down here. U.S. average on this overall, about 6%, just to give you some idea of how bad the problem is. But despite all that crowded housing, rents have not gone up in the California economy for the last few years. Again, indicative of the fact that we're building up this large mass of low-skilled, low-pay workers, and despite the fact that we're cramming more and more into this existing apartment base, there's not even enough demand there to drive rents up in any substantial means. So, crowded housing, not the issue for prices, for housing prices in California. Now, I've told you that, wow, we've seen prices go up a lot, and wow, we've, we're building quite a few new residents, but I haven't told you why I use that nasty B word, a bubble. So, to answer that, you got to back up for a second. Let's define what a bubble is. A long time ago, an economist talked about a very interesting market situation, and he used a he or she, as the case may be, I have no idea, used a terrible word to describe this market situation. This economist called it a bubble. Now, why is that a terrible word? It's a terrible word because people immediately think that when you say the word bubble, you mean pop, and that is to say that it's something that has to be characterized by a rapid run-up in prices and then a rapid, rapid drop in prices. That's not the case. I'll give you a scenario. Um, as opposed to economics, I got my degree in biochemistry. I'm out partying late with some friends and in the midst of drinking all that bad beer, uh, I fall asleep and wake up in the morning with a weird chemical formula in my head. I run off to work and I mix this, 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 in this magical thing that formed in my head as a result of bad beer. And lo and behold, I've created a pill that when you take this pill, it gives you six packs abs, raises your IQ by 15 points, and allows you to run a marathon. What happens to the stock price of my company? Straight up. Now, after a couple weeks of testing, we find out a little problem. You take this pill for two weeks, your arms fall off. Stock price goes back down again. That's not a bubble. Remember what, what an asset is. An asset is a claim on something that gives you a return, a stream of value today and in the future. Your expectations of that stream of values may go up and then may go down again. That's perfectly rational. That doesn't define a bubble. So what does define a bubble? A bubble is defined by when what the market price of the asset is has no absolute basis in reality of the fundamentals of what kind of returns that asset can actually produce in the future. Amazon.com at $200 per share. That is a bubble. There was a, a, great, a great financial economist at UCLA a few years back, and he sat down and did this kind of back of the envelope calculation. He asked a question. What if Amazon.com had captured 100% of the DVD market, the book market, and the CD market? Would they ever have made the profits necessary to justify the capitalization embodied in a $200 per share price? And the answer was not even close. Not even close. So that's what a bubble is. when the fundamentals say this, and the market's saying this. So how do you think about that? Well, in the case of real estate, the real estate, of course, gives you a stream of value into the future we call rents. How do you think about a house? Well, two things. What is rental growth going to look like in the future? And why do I discount those future rental values to today's terms. In other words, I need to know rental growth and the mortgage rate. If future rental markets look strong, say because of the fact that we have a shortage of housing, which we don't, then of course the price today will go up. If on the other hand we're building lots and it looks like future rental markets are going to be weak, that would imply that prices should go down. Same thing with mortgage rates. If mortgage rates rise, that implies those future rents are not so valuable and prices go down today. If rent mortgage rates fall, prices go up today. Two things to keep in mind. First of all, everybody, buyers always think, home buyers always think that oh, low mortgage rates are good, high mortgage rates are bad. That's not necessarily the case. There's an offsetting effect. Mortgage rates go up, prices go down. So you're paying a higher rate on a smaller price. You're not necessarily better or worse off. On the other side of the fence, Again, going back to the National Association of Realtors, who, yes, I'm going to pick on a lot today. Um, they say, of course, that right, prices are going up today because mortgage rates are low. Well, first of all, they're not that low, all right, from a historical context. But obviously, they are low relative to what they've been over the last 30 years. 
But the second, more important point, of course, it's not the level of the mortgage rates, it's the change in the mortgage rates that's important. If mortgage rates are at 50 percent, 20 percent, or 1 percent, I don't care. If they're not changing, they no longer have a substantial long-run influence over the price of a home. They're done. They're out of the equation at that point in time. So, let's think about what happened. Late 90s, obviously, economy booming along, incomes going up, and of course, throw into the mix that nice little tax change that lets you sell your house capital gains free. You mix that all up, and yeah, housing prices legitimately rose right through 2001, no problem. Of course, in 2001, the economy weakened, demand came off rents, and rents started to fall. But that's, of course, when the Fed and the Chinese got involved. And between the help of the Fed cutting short-term rates and the help of the Chinese lending us lots of money, those long-term rates started to fall, and they fell right through the beginning of 2003. And that drove home prices up. But the beginning of 2003, about this first quarter, maybe second, I don't know, however you want to time it, the answer was, at that point in time, is look, all the stimulus is off the real estate sector. All right? There's no more interest rate cuts. In fact, if anything, it's going to start coming up. And of course, the rental markets remain relatively weak. There's no reason to believe that real estate prices should do anything but flatten out, maybe grow at the pace of inflation. And what did we see? We saw real estate prices explode. We saw more appreciation through 2004 and 2005 than we had seen through the previous three years. That is a real estate bubble because all the indicators say this and the market's doing this. And that, that's, that's a problem. So I like to say, you know, well, how do these things get started? How does it happen? How do you move into this bubble mentality? Well, I learned about this firsthand when I was sitting at lunch in West Hollywood a few, a few months ago with a friend of mine. We're having lunch and sitting down in the booth behind us, we sit down and there are three actors behind us who I like to listen to because they're always quite amusing. But I started listening to these three actors, and lo and behold, what are they talking about? Real estate. Now, I could stop right there. We know it's a bubble when actors are talking about real estate, okay? <laughs> but it was what they said that really made me think. Because what they said was this. Was one guy said, whoa, dude, my condo's gone up like $100,000 in value. What should I do? And the other guy says, pull it out. Buy another condo. Really? Why? It's free money. And that scared, that set a chill down my spine. It's free money. And that's exactly the kind of attitude you're seeing out there right now. It works this way. People don't think about fundamentals. They think about trends. And what they saw was starting in about 1999 to about 2003, real estate was a great investment. And it really was for legitimate reasons. But they didn't think about those legitimate reasons. They see a trend. And the trend is real estate is free money. So now you move into a, a, a part, portion in time in which suddenly people rush in to get that free money. And lo and behold, because they're rushing in to get free money, what does the market do? Prices go up, causing more people to get in, causing prices to go up, causing more people to get in. And it feeds and it feeds and it feeds until you're basically in a real estate frenzy. And that's exactly what we've been in over the last couple of years. Now, when does this thing end? How does it end? Well, the answer is as soon as you can't get in the bottom end anymore. As soon as prices are so out of whack that you can't justify it in your head, as soon as prices, prices are so out of whack that no bank will lend you that money, even if you want a negative amortization, variable rate, no doc, 5% over prime loan. I don't care what you're willing to sign. I am not going to give you a million dollars for a 400 square foot apartment in Santa Monica, okay? And that's when these things end. So I like to say, uh, what do these two guys have in common? And that, of course, is our, outstand, our outgoing uh, chairman, uh, Mr. Greenspan. On the right, of course, is Mr. Palmiero. He had a, a few problems with pharmaceutical products during the course of the latest baseball season. Uh, of course, what they had and both have in common is that neither will admit they did anything wrong in order to artificially boost performance. <laughs> Oh, that went over well. That's good. Okay. Uh, so here's some common housing myths that I'm constantly fighting against. Inventory levels are low, so the market is fine. Inventory levels are low because everybody's rushing around trying to get that free money. Uh, price is one of my favorites. This is another. Uh, so you know, the National Association of Realtors. Uh, realtors are in the midst of an incredible income boom in this country right now. They are making billions hand over fist, and the National Association of Realtors is right in there doing what they should be, and that's pitching to keep it going as long as possible. And they have come up with every excuse 
I have, I mean, just amazing stuff. One of my favorite prices are up because boomers are getting funds from their dying parents. Now, besides the grim overtones of this particular statement, uh, it's also complete nonsense. Uh, economists are, believe in, in what we call rational expectations, and that is to say that people take a long-run view of the world. Uh, Milton Friedman, who won the Nobel Prize, uh, one of the reasons he won the Nobel Prize for what he called the, um, um, oh boy, Ross, help me out here. What's permanent income? Permanent income. Income. <laughs> yeah. It's been a long drive this morning. The permanent <laughs> income hypothesis, which says that people think towards a long run and they consumption smooth. A very simple idea. Well, let me explain something. Boomers have been terrible savers for a long time. And part of the reason they could be terrible savers is they had already been counting up their parents' bank accounts about 1982, okay? <laughs> There's no mystery here. They knew exactly what they were getting a long time ago. So don't tell me this is having influence now. Demand is strong because people are buying second homes. Again, second homes are all about free money. I want to ask is how good of an investment is that going to be if no one's going to live in it? Remember the pace of building. Here's my favorite. This is the Orange County refrain. Our region is different, okay? <laughs> uh, I have literally been giving this talk in Orange County, and, you know, and I have literally had someone raise their hand and go, yeah, yeah, we know you people in Riverside and L.A. are screwed, but in Orange County, we're different, you know? And I'm like, no, you're not, okay? Uh, the reality is this. I've studied these, some of these past cycles. No region is in isolation. Yes, it is true that people don't necessarily move directly from Rancho Cucamonga to Laguna Niguel. I wouldn't argue that for a second. But people do move up the chain as they go along. You'll move from Compton to South Central. You move from South Central to, I don't know, uh, uh, say R Redondo, and you move from Redondo to say, El Segundo, El Segundo to Venice, and so on and so forth. All these markets are linked at the margin, and the reality is, is when these real estate cycles move, the overall movement of prices dominate any kind of inter-region or, as the case may be, inter-housing type of changes. That is to say, it's not like houses are safer than condos or that Laguna Niguel is safer than Riverside. It doesn't work that way. The over aggregate movements in the market dominate any kind of these inter, inter whatever, inter uh, regional differences. And of course, last but not least, you guys said that last year and you were wrong then. Uh, we've gotten hate mail. We've been talking about this. I'm not kidding. We've been talking about this for a couple of years now at UCLA. We're worried about real estate. We've had letters come in that go something like this. Uh, Dear Dr. Thornburg, you've ruined my life. <laughs> I listened to you and did not buy that house last year and it's gone up $80,000 in value and now I am doomed to living in a one-bedroom apartment with my 16 kids for the next 40 years. Thank you very much. Sign whoever, whoever. Um, Listen, I, I realize that we've been talking about this for two years, but I'll tell you right now that there's an old saying, economists get this direction right and the timing wrong. Uh, and and in, in many ways, this is because we're being asked to forecast what's essentially an irrational market. It's like asking a psychologist to say, hey, what's that crazy guy going to say next? If I knew that, he wouldn't be crazy. Um, Again, another story. 1997, economists said, we're a little worried about this thing called NASDAQ. These tech stocks seem a little overvalued to us. In 1998, we're like, we're a lot worried about NASDAQ. This doesn't seem rational to us. In 1999, we all sat around and said, this is complete insanity. This is clearly a bubble market, and you ought to watch out. And in the beginning of 2000, we opened our mouths, and we were told collectively by the entire financial community to shut up. It's a new world. It's a new economy. Go back to the drawing board, you old fuddy-duddies, and find your new models, because it don't work anymore in this wonderful world. Where's NASDAQ today, folks? in real terms back about where it was in 1997, all right? So don't think that just because this has gone on for a while, don't think trends, think fundamentals. Uh, now, of course, for those of you who may have been paying attention to the literature, I'm not sure how many um, economists I have in the room. Not too long ago, uh, a paper came out in uh, one of the journals in economics uh, by these three gentlemen who claimed that, in fact, we were wrong, the bubble was not there, and prices were exactly where they needed to be. And they had done a slightly different kind of analysis from what I had done in the past. Uh, what they did, of course, was look kind of the one-year cost of an apartment compared to the one-year cost of a house. And what they came up with when he sat down and looked at it was, lo and behold, prices were right where they needed to be given their particular calculations. 
Well, this kind of fascinated me, and I couldn't really understand it because the drivers they used in their models didn't seem to pan out from a historical perspective. So I went through and looked at their numbers, and what I did was I tracked their calculations going all the way back to 1988, and this is basically the difference between what they say the fundamental price should be and what the actual market price should be. And it turns out that the last time prices were exactly where they should have been was, yeah, you guessed it, about 1989. Gee, hmm. And then through the midst of the booming 90s, and in 2000 and 2001, turns out the real estate in California was, get this, 40% undervalued. Wow, what a dope we all were, huh? Little did we know we should have been buying real estate up like mad. Clearly there's something wrong with these guys' model. How they ever got this paper published is an absolute mystery to me, but I don't believe it. For personally, I have a couple uh, reasons why I think their analysis is wrong. I won't get into that because it's a little bit arcane. What I am going to get into next, of course, is when is this thing going to end? Now, do bear in mind yet again that these things are built on as kind of a, a feeding frenzy and a, and a self-fulfilling prophecy kind of market. You know the market's going to end. You know this thing's going to start cooling on the basis of unit sales because unit sales represent this self-fulfilling prophecy kind of cycle. When this thing's rising rapidly, that implies lots of people are trying to get that free money. Hence, the market's going up, and when, and when you see unit sales starting to go down, that implies this thing's starting to cool, and you're pulling that self-fulfilling driver out of the market. Going back to the, the late 80s, early 90s, this is unit sales for California and mortgage rates. And look very carefully. The market peaked about 1989, and after it started falling dramatically, you know, that was pretty much it. The, 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 the party was over, even as mortgage rates fell. A lot of people say, you know, is this going to be a mortgage rate phenomenon? We're way beyond mortgage rates. Now, a spike in mortgage rates can end this bubble quicker, there's no doubt about it, but this is not an interest rate driven phenomenon anymore. We're way beyond that. Prices have gone way beyond anything having to do with interest rates. And on the right hand side is sales and real prices, inflation adjusted prices, and you can see about a year after they peak and started coming down, real prices also starting to fall. You can see a big break there, but again, there's a big lag. The market starts to peak, it starts to cool, and about a year later, that's when the ump comes out of the market. It takes a little while for the slowdown to feed through to, um, to overall activity. Well, I don't need to tell you where we are right now in California. You all know. It's been, it's been a kind of a different kind of cycle from last time, I have to admit this. In fact, overall unit sales peaked almost a year ago. Almost a year ago, and it's been basically been up and down for quite a while. One of the reasons for this is that back in the late 80s, it ended more dramatically because we had a distinct withdrawal of credit from the market due to the SNL crisis. There was, a, if you all remember back then, the SNL started to get closed down left, right, and center. As a result of that, a lot of money was withdrawn from the market, and that ended things very quickly. Now, banks have gotten a little shy, but we've had a whole bunch of subprime lenders who have stepped right into the void doing all sorts of things. Now there's a lot of talk about these guys and what they mean and what they're doing and there's a lot of worry, but they're still out there pitching like mad. Um, and if you want to know where most of these guys are based, drive down the 405 through Costa Mesa because about six or seven of the buildings there have their names labeled right across the top of the building. Is Orange County different? Yes, they are. They're going to get hammered when this thing breaks. <laughs> I sound a little too gleeful there, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but be that as it may, of course, San Diego you, uh, has seen over the last year a big cooling of the markets. Overall unit sales are clearly coming down. Napa, Alameda, Ventura, Santa Clara. In fact, the only places that are still warm is the Inland Empire. But you're seeing this negative numbers across the state. It looks a lot like the beginning of the end, folks. Now, you know, we've been wrong before on this, perhaps a cut in interest rates, which isn't going to happen, but perhaps something out there could happen and get this thing moving again. But I, every, every economic bone in my body is screaming, this is the peak, we're starting to come down the backside. Now remember what that means. This thing's going to start cooling, but the problems aren't going to form for a while yet. I can tell you right now, for the first couple of quarters of this year, you're going to continue to see strong growth rates. Uh, so this is going to take a little while to feed back, but it sure looks like we've come over the crest. And again, you can't argue, things are still hot. Inventory levels are starting to come up. Uh, U.S. sales are starting to come down. 
But again, even at the U.S. level, unfortunately, I forgot to put this graph in here, but I have a wonderful graph sitting on here. Right now at the U.S. level, there are five, a half a million single-family homes for sale in the U.S. economy. We've never had that many new single-family homes for sale at one time in the past. So when you look at that inventory of new homes out there, very, very high. Inventory levels in California are starting to rise. Everything's saying that things are, in fact, starting to come to a close. Now, what does this mean for you? Does this mean sell your house, move in with mom and dad? Well, not unless you want to end up in jail, which I would if I ended up living with my parents for a couple of years. Um, the key here, of course, is that, again, you got to get this idea, this concept in your mind of bubble and the pop out of your brain when it comes to real estate. When, it, when a stock market bubble pops, what you get is you get hyper liquidity, buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell. Everybody's trying to get out of the market, trying to get back into the market, trying to get deals, trying to make money and lose, not lose money as the case may be. You get hyper market liquidity and prices drop very rapidly. Housing markets are not the same as stock markets. You don't day trade your home. Just that simple. You don't do it. And it seems like a simple thing to say, but the fixed costs of buying and selling homes are enormous. The taxes and the personal costs involved are such that people don't do that lightly. They don't day trade on their computer their homes. What ends up happening instead, you get an exact opposite type of market pop. It's not a pop on the price side, it's a pop on the liquidity side. What you get is a circumstance in which people basically don't buy and don't sell their home. They turn off the TV, they cancel the newspaper, and they forbid their children from talking to their neighbors who may be moving. They don't want to know. We don't want to know. But the only time you see real estate prices fall in nominal terms is if you lose a lot of jobs in the local economy. What I have here is the annual change in employment between 89 and 94 and appreciation between 89 and 94. And those places that saw housing prices fall in, in nominal terms were those places that lost jobs. If you didn't lose jobs, housing prices didn't fall or if they fell, fell very slowly. Nonetheless, what goes up will come down. This is appreciation between 84 and 90. Each one of these dots is a state. Appreciation between 90 and 97. Those that saw the big run up in prices in the late 80s saw no price appreciation in any meaningful word for the almost most of the 90s. That's what these markets do. So in other words, there's two ways these things can converge. Here you got the fundamental price. Here you got the real price. So the two things that can happen is you have prices drop till you get back to fundamentals, and then they start growing or they go flat for six years. However the case may be, is at some point in time in the future, the fundamentals and the market price have to converge. That can happen rapidly or it can happen slowly, but it's gonna happen one way or the other. Our best guess at this point in time, it's gonna happen slowly. What this means, the price of your house today is gonna be the price of your house in 2011, maybe even 2012. So again, moving in with your parents, not a real good choice, okay? You're not going to buy your house back for a 25% discount next year. Ain't going to happen. What is going to happen, of course, is that real estate is a low value, trend, low value investment for a while now. Because in real terms, the price is going to fall, and you're going to lose money as a result of that. People say, does that mean I shouldn't buy a home right now? Well, sometimes you got to buy a home. If you're going to buy a home, don't plan on appreciation. Understand it's a low return investment. Stay within your means. Whatever you do, don't buy outside of your current financial means and expect appreciation to bail you out. That's the fundamental rule for real estate right now. Be very, very cautious. Uh, nonetheless, it's still going to have an impact on the economy. Big downturn in sales. That means all those real estate agents and mortgage brokers, they're going to lose their jobs. Construction is also going to go down. People who build, buy new homes are selling their existing home. If you're not selling your existing home, you're not buying a new home. A big downturn there means the construction market takes a hit. What are the big three, three drivers of the California economy? Building new homes, buying and selling and financing our new homes, and furnishing our new homes. The three biggest drivers of the California economy right now are going to be removed. And of course, the big unknown man out there are those wealth effects. What does it mean for the economy when that $80,000 in new wealth doesn't arrive in 2006 and 2007. This is a big mystery. I'm not going to make a claim I know what's going to happen here. This is a tough thing to figure out, in large part because we've never been here before. We've never seen this kind of run up in real estate prices before. 
I, as a forecaster, use the past to predict the future. I assume that past patterns will be, will be repeated again in the future. Well, if I don't have any past patterns, I'm running blind. And that's where we are right now. We're running blind. We do have a couple examples. One of those examples is Japan. Japan in the late 80s had a massive run-up in real estate prices. Their prices fell nominally about 2% a year for about 10 years. That's kind of a worst case scenario. Another good example is Texas in the late 80s. Texas in the late 80s, early 80s, of course, was the oil boom town, and real estate prices increased, increased at an incredible pace. In Texas, when the oil thing broke, a lot of those oil towns were absolutely decimated in terms of employment, and there, there are some substantial declines in overall prices, in some cases on the order of 10% per year in nominal terms. But again, they were losing lots of jobs, lots of jobs wrapped there in the oil industry. California does not have any of that risk, as far as I can tell right now, here. There's not enough of that kind of uh, boom employment to really drag the entire California economy down. And of course, added to that, there is some basic good news. Productivity growth continues, business spending continues, the dollar is down, which is bringing tourists and manufacturing, uh, more demand for U.S. manufactured products, uh, film production is coming back to Southern California. Corporations, as opposed to being in a state of being overinvested right now, are sending out massive war chests. They have huge amounts of savings. This is one part of the economy that is saving right now, and that may cause them to not get, suffer very much on the way down, and that can lend support to the economy. And of course, overall cyclical employment, primarily in that manufacturing sector, well, those manufacturing sector jobs never came back. And so it's a big question whether how much potential downturn there is in manufacturing employment. And if you don't lose a lot of manufacturing jobs, that may again help soften the overall blow of a cooling housing market on the U.S. economy. But no matter how you add it up, basically you have increasing external demand being offset by decreasing internal demand, and at best you got mediocre. At best you have mediocre. And that's what our forecast really is through the end of 2006 through 2007. We're looking for mediocre. But the downside risk is substantially higher than the upside risk at this particular point in time. Could this cause a recession? It might. Are we willing to say it's going to? No. It's very difficult to predict at this point in time. We could see out a year, there's no recession in the cards for the next year. 2006 is going to be fine. But 2007, still a bit of a mystery. So of course, the end of 2006, we have a big election. We're going to have Schwarzenegger, the sequel. Or are we? Right? That's the big question. Uh, of course, he's hoping for an economy that looks like this, and he's got an economy that looks like that. All right? Um, this may make his chances not so good. So, wrapping up, our forecast for 2006, that yield curve in the short run we think is going to remain flat. We think that the 10-year treasuries are going to start coming up again, even as the Fed continues to tighten. Again, we expect weakness in housing for the U.S. overall, with building permits starting to fall. We're not predicting a free fall yet, but we are definitely predicting some sort of major cooling through this year. Um, less than normal growth because of housing-related job losses, not to mention drag from the negative wealth. Um, and of course, again, no recession in the near future. Thank you so much, everyone. I appreciate it. Again, thank you for your patience.